Yeah, Darren, that verse from John. In this world, you will have troubles. Um, but Jesus has overcome the world. And that is really one of the things I'm interested about the Christian life. We're not promised a pass on all troubles. Relational troubles, it's just, it's part of our experience. Today we're going to talk about forgiveness. And um, from the book of Philemon, actually we'll be in Philemon for a couple of weeks. So looking forward to that. All right. First off, I wanted to just remind us of who we are, what we're doing. So this is at Grace Life, our desire is that others might put their faith in Jesus Christ, grow in their knowledge of him, and as a result, be increasingly like him, living in accordance with the teachings of God's word in attitudes and actions. So we have some symbols here that kind of represent what we're doing. There are values. We value knowing God and his word. That's high on our, our priorities. We value experiencing grace and forgiveness in responding with grace and forgiveness to each other. We value engagement and impact globally. A lot of stuff going on here in this body, this church that reaches beyond America. We're excited about that. And growing in healthy relationships. So today's focus is going to be on the growing in healthy relationships, primarily focusing on forgiveness. Okay? Just thought I'd give you that little heads up. So, the book of Philemon. If you want to turn there, go to Revelation. It's the last book. And then go backwards about nine little books. It's only one page, so there's, there's a chance you could miss it, but it's an amazing little book. We're going to be looking at the first seven verses today. We'll pick it up and kind of keep going the next couple weeks, but I'm really looking forward to this. So um, Philemon, chapter 1, I'm just going to read through this. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our brother, fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because, my, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. So, um, the main point we're going to be hitting today is, is pretty simple. Because we've been forgiven, we can and we should extend forgiveness. Now, that's not rocket science, but somehow in the nitty-gritty of our relationships, it is so hard, right? So, this is where we're going. Um, check out these verses. Colossians says, in Jesus Christ, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So, if we don't go to Jesus to experience forgiveness, we're not going to be able to effectively pass that on to others. So, he's, he's our first stop, right? Um, the next verse forgiving each other as we have been forgiven you also must forgive Ephesians talks about let all bitterness anger and clamor and slander be put away but forgive one another so it's it's um it's a natural and normal thing for spiritually healthy people to do okay i i, I want to drive this home that the expectation that spiritually mature people have no problems is not based in reality we live in a fallen world, and, and we have problems. We have interpersonal problems, and it's normal to forgive and extend forgiveness instead of thinking every conflict. This morning at our 9 o'clock thing, we had a thing on conflict. Well, conflict is normal. It's just how we handle it, right? And so forgiveness is really, really what we want to go there. So I'm going to do a little bit of historical background here, okay? Uh, we'll have time for a test at the end, so that'll be, that'll be exciting. Um, Philemon. Now, the book of Philemon, honestly, I still get the main characters mixed up. There's this guy called Onesimus. There's Philemon. One of them's a slave. One of them's the, well, not a slave. Well, so I'm going to try to get it right, all right? Philemon is the slave-owning Christian businessman. Just let that sink in. Slave-owning Christian wealthy businessman, okay? I'll talk about slavery in about five, seven minutes. Anyway, he lived in a city called Colossae, about 100 miles from Ephesus. Saved by Paul's ministry, maybe when Paul spent three years in Ephesus, because that's, they traveled around, and, and that 
seems logical. Philemon hosted a house church in his house regularly. So his house is big enough to have church in it, and he has at least one slave, so he is a, he's a wealthy guy. And um, Paul got arrested later on in Rome after three years. So that's just kind of a little bit of a story there. Philemon is this guy. Sometime Paul got arrested, and Paul goes to Rome. And then there's this guy called Onesimus. At least that's how I'm pronouncing it, all right? Um, and he's one of Philemon's slaves, and he steals some stuff, hits the road, where else to go but Rome, million people, hide in the big city of Rome. And that's going well for him until he bumps into this guy in jail called Paul. Now, Paul's in jail, but how, how Onesimus kind of bumped into him in the proximity of jail, I don't know. But anyway, that happened, and then um, he gets saved. Onesimus finds Jesus, and then he starts to serve Paul. Paul says, he served me during my imprisonment. So they're growing together, and then, and then Onesimus grows in his faith, and eventually he becomes convicted of, yeah, I stole stuff, and I ran away, and he talks to Paul. Now this is why we have this book. The reason we have Philemon is because Onesimus went to Paul and said, what do I do? Here's my story. And Paul's like, oh, yeah, I know him. And so he writes a letter, okay? So um, Paul the Apostle wrote a letter to Philemon, a guy, not a, well, he writes to the church, we'll talk about too, but it's primarily to a guy from jail in Rome, urging Philemon to forgive Onesimus and accept him back. It's kind of where we're going. But here's a bit of a story in the context. Paul then sends a letter to Philemon. Now, he lives in Colossae, so this is where, but Paul's in jail, so he can't go. So he's going to get two guys, Tychicus and um, Philemon, to go and deliver the letter. Um, that's not, anyway, moving on. <laughs> um, to Colossae. All right, so here's, here's the thing. So Paul is in prison, and Onesimus is hiding out in Rome. And Paul is going to send a letter to the owner, Philemon, who lives in Colossae. I just want you to see that it's logical for Paul to think in terms of, if you're going to go to Colossae, the, his messengers are going to have to stop in Ephesus, all right? And so that, that starts his thinking, um, because Philemon is here. And so what happens here is that um, Tychicus, Tychicus, Philemon will be passing through Ephesus, and uh, so they're probably going to drop off the letter. Here's the verse from Colossians. Um, Tychicus will tell you about my activities. I've sent him to you for this very purpose. Uh, with him is Onesimus. Okay? So the slide said Philemon. It should have been Onesimus. So Onesimus and Tychicus are the messengers going to give the letter to the man Philemon. And they'll tell you everything that's going on here in Rome. So that's what Paul says uh, in Colossians. Okay? So... Yeah, it should say Onesimus there. That's really funny. Anyway, um, Paul sent Tychicus and Onesimus from Rome to Ephesus where they dropped off the letter of Ephesians. Okay, so the letter of Ephesians is in this little story. Also, the letter of Colossians in the, is in the story. Paul's like, well, hey, if, if you're going to go all the way to Coloss Colossae, I've, I'll write a letter to them. You're going to pass through Ephesus. I'll write a letter to the Ephesians. And so that's what he does. Okay, then they delivered Paul's letter to the man Philemon in Colossae, and finally then they delivered Onesimus to Philemon. So um, these are all called the prison epistles, and this is how it works out in, in chronologically. Paul sends Tychicus and Onesimus from Rome to Ephesus, and then they went to Colossae, dropped off Colossians. They go to Philemon, deliver that letter to him, and then finally deliver Onesimus. So that's what he's doing. All right. Um, a quick note on slavery. A little bit of background here. Slavery is a whole different deal in the New Testament. It wasn't chattel racial slavery. It was economic. In fact, many doctors and lawyers would choose to be slaves. Um, well, not choose, but the circumstances, that, that, was, that was an option for them, okay? So it was so normal in this culture, nobody in the culture is talking about it. No one's abdicating to get rid of it. It's just something in the culture that... Um, that existed. It's a little bit like this, because um, it's nothing like our experience here, but it would be like finding a permanent job with a permanent boss that had permanent control over what you did or didn't do. You can't just leave. 
You're getting paid, you got a house, you got a job, but you just can't leave. Okay, so that's kind of a weird, a weird model for us, all right? Um, up to 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire in the first century. And the Roman Empire is huge, so that's kind of a, a huge number. But in the Old Testament, it's got a rundown on slavery. The Old Testament didn't abolish it. It regulated it, okay, because it wasn't race-based slavery. It was economic hardship slavery. Um, in fact, you know, the Old Testament commanded the death penalty for man-stealing slavery. Um, tried to protect the slave through limits on slavery. And then in the New Testament, the word doulos can be translated as servant or bondservant. And um, even New Testament slaves had a ton of rights. So it's a different category. I just really want to drive that home. Slavery is still wrong. Anytime you, you, you hinder, limit, and prison a person, that's obviously not God's intent and wrong. But we just have to understand it's a whole different deal, all right? So neither Christ nor the apostles are active in abolishing it, which is fascinating. But we're going to see in this book, if this book is followed and you exercise love in the relationship, it's going to just erode the institution of slavery, right? So um, that's what's going on there. So is the Bible pro-slavery? You get some people on the internet and forums going, oh, hey, look at these verses. The Bible's pro-slavery. And you just back up and think in context, all right? Bond servants, obey your masters, obey in everything, subject. So... What you got to do here is understand the context, the culture, what does it mean to them. In fact, here's, here's a, I love this quote in, in yellow. If you want to know what the Bible means, you first have to learn what it meant. If you want to know what the Bible means, you first have to know what it meant to the first original audience. That's who it's written to, okay? So... Our experience with slavery and whatever other issue you want, you grab a verse and run with it, all my emotions and my painful experiences are going to color how I understand God's word. And I'm not then understanding what it meant. I'm, I'm making up what it means to me. And then we're off. Okay? So Bible study is super important. The first original readers. Um, in fact, can I drop this, this on you too? This, this might blow your mind. In any given passage of scripture, there is one meaning. Does that make you uncomfortable? Because, because I kind of grew up, you hear people, oh, to me it means this, and to you it means this. But the words I'm speaking now have one meaning. Don't go take these words and create some crazy thing. That's not what I'm saying. So many applications from the one meaning. So we find the meaning in the original context, and there's a lot of timeless truths that come our way and a lot of applications. So that's a Bible study kind of thing there. But uh, slavery's kryptonite is love. I mentioned that before. If, if, if Paul doesn't seek to blow up the institution, he doesn't, he doesn't f uh, file legal charges against the city, and he doesn't pick it, he just interjects love into this social structure. I find that fascinating, right? Interjecting love to transform culture um, seems to be what, he, what he's going Okay, a little bit of like uh, class time here. I just think this is fun. I observe this. I'm always trying to make things easy to remember. So these are the prison epistles. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. We're, we're doing Philemon today. But now just look at this. Paul wrote one book on the first journey. Second journey, two books, Thessalonians. Third journey, three books. So, and, and then four. So just kind of one, two, three, four. I don't know. I just think that's neat. Um, so... That the, the prison epistles, here's another way to, another fun way to remember which books are the prison epistles. Every prisoner causes problems, <laughs> right? E-P-C-P, -P. every prisoner causes problems. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. See, this is on the test, like in 20 minutes, so it's okay. Good, anyway. <clears throat> and then I, since these books were written at the same time, the same occasion, in fact, uh, Onesimus and Tychicus were carrying them to Philemon. It's not surprising we have a ton of similar concepts and thoughts. So just look, look at the similarities here. You have Ephesians, Colossians. You know, um, there's Tychicus mentioned and, and Onesimus. Stewardship of the gospel, stewardship of the gospel. We have holy and blameless language. So very similar concepts between Ephesians and Colossians, which um, Tychicus and Onesimus carried with them. Christ is the head of the body head over all things to the church, the mystery, the mystery, Epaphras, a bunch of people show up here, right? Um, Archippus, um, 
Aristarchus, Mark, Demas, Luke. So um, all that to say it's coming out of the same context. And Paul is sending these letters through the hands of Anesimus and Tychicus to, um, to Philemon. So, you know, Nelson Mandela was in prison a long time. His story is brutal. I don't know if you know his story, story but in, in, in jail for 18 years or so. And um, I looked this up. He was in prison in a damp concrete cell measuring 8 feet by 7 feet with a straw mat on which to sleep. Verbally, verbally and physically harassed. Uh, he spent their days breaking rocks into gravel. Um, got eye damage because of the bright sun. He was just in the sun every day. And yet when he leaves, he says, as I was released out the door that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. And that is so true with forgiveness. If I refuse to forgive someone else, I'm the one in prison. And it may not seem fair because sometimes people hurt us. They don't even know they hurt us. They're not asking for forgiveness. That doesn't stop me from extending it. Sometimes I extend forgiveness to people who are clueless. They have no idea what's going on. That's, that's appropriate, okay? Sometimes we have to have a conversation or whatever, but there are times maybe someone's passed away and you just can't have that conversation. That's very frequent. In that case, you write some things out and, and you just, before the Lord, Lord, I release this person for the pain, whatever they cause me, and we can forgive. So that's a good example there too. Okay, so now we're in chapter 1, verse 1. He starts off by saying he's a prisoner, a prisoner for Christ Jesus and Timothy to Philemon. So this is what he's doing, okay? Um, interesting, though, in the other letters, look what Paul says. He's like Paul an apostle. Well, why, why would Paul switch from his customary Paul an apostle to Paul a prisoner? Well, because you know the book, he, he's going to be advocating for the prisoner, and he's identifying with the prisoner, and he's telling his friend Philemon, hey, I, I know suffering. I know what it's like to be lowly. And so he's entering in at that level as a prisoner, not as a powerful apostle, which is huge. And um, no fewer than five. I found five. But uh, he references in, in one page book, one letter, five times about his prisoner, prisoner, prisoner. Okay, so this is the theme that he really, really values. And then he talks about Ann Timothy. And I'm always curious. I'm like, well, why, why is he dragging Timothy everywhere? And I wonder if it's part of discipleship training. Because in two short years after this was written, he is going to take young Timothy and drop him off in Ephesus and say, hey, shut down all the false teachers who have PhDs, who are older than you, more experienced than you. You need to shut them down and start Institute Correct Teaching. you know how hard that would be? That's, that's like, no wonder he has stomach issues, right? And so I'm thinking here that Paul is trying to help Timothy understand this is how you go about confronting. This is how you go about gently persuading, okay? Some people would say manipulating, but I don't, th I don't see Paul doing that here, all right? But anyway, so, um, and then it, it's not only to Timothy, but all these other people, some people kind of um, uh, think it might be um, Philemon's family members. But anyway, the point is, Paul is saying, hey, there's a plurality of people watching you here. So whatever you do with Onesimus, we're all watching. And I just wonder if that's a healthy expectation. That he's like, yeah, we're, we're watching. Well, we'll see what you do with this, Philemon. Because you know the right thing to do. So we're just, anyway, I don't know if that's going on there, but that's, um, that's interesting. So the first thing we want to do is get to the mental approach to forgiveness. Next week, we'll talk about a spiritual approach to forgiveness as we move through the book. But right now... The mental approach to forgiveness. And this is a fun, um, what I call the affirmation sandwich. So if you've got notes, a little bulletin, there's a blank there for affirmation sandwich. And this is just, this is just common sense, um, or at least it's wisdom. Maybe not common. Sometimes common sense isn't very common. But it, it is wise, and you know people are doing this to you if they start talking about how great you are. Hey, yeah, you're awesome at this. You're always good, and you're like... Okay, well, what, what do you want me to change, right? And, and we know they're doing it, but we kind of like need that. We like that. If you just come up and go, hey, stop this, start that, oh, it's kind of harsh. I don't feel appreciated. Okay, this is what Paul does. Watch what he does. He affirms 
he shares his main concern, and then he affirms. All right? I remember you. I'm, I'm thankful for you. I hear about your impact with other people. My main concern is I want your faith to grow. And uh, we have joy thinking about you. It's just interesting, right? Okay? So um, this is where he's going to go. So let's move in here and take the first verse so in this section here. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. So, if I hadn't already shared that with you, you know, if you just sat down with a cup of coffee and said, I'm going to read an entire book of the Bible, Philemon, and you're, you're out to find what is his main concern? What is Paul's main concern? What would you think? I mean, maybe it's, you know, to get Philemon to do what's right. Is it somehow to capture the runaway slave? Uh, I mean, if you're thinking about the main concern, it seems like it's, it's, a, it's a spiritual and a relational concern, all right? He says, I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective. Now, the word sharing, koinonia, means fellowship, but it also has the meaning, the wide range of meaning of, of participation or contribution, so I'm praying that the contribution, the participation, the exercise of your faith, all right? Because I'm going to give you an opportunity here, Philemon, in just a few verses to do something about your growing faith. So I pray that it would become effective. As we walk with Jesus, it's normal for us to want to, to desire to express more grace and more kindness. That's a normal, healthy progression of spiritual growth, right? So that's what's going on. He has a relational concern. He has a spiritual concern. He wants Philemon to relationally accept Onesimus back. And spiritually, he wants Philemon to exercise his own faith. Because you go through the letters, like, I could command you, I could, all these heavy things. But then he backs up. I, I want you to do this yourself. He doesn't throw down the apostle card. He's like, I'm a prisoner, and, you know, I'm, I'm kind of relating to this guy over here, Onesimus. But Philemon, you're going to do what's right. I want your faith to grow. That is the heart of this letter. Paul wants Philemon's faith to grow through his own free choice of doing what's right. Now, that's going to be countercultural. As I'll explain next week, there were laws about runaway slaves. They were to be captured, apprehended, turned in. There's a, there's a wanted list, just like the top 10, the FBI thing. And, and so when Paul comes along and starts to say things like, oh, hey, let's just talk, Paul is stepping out of the culture. So there's, there's a lot of risk going on here, countercultural risk. So he wants Philemon to exercise and show that he is growing in his faith, all right? Um, if Paul forces this issue, if he just throws down his, his power, he could win the battle but lose the war. You ever done that? You know, you, you, you win a battle, some tension, and, and whatever, through whatever means you... You win, but you realize only a day later that you lost the bigger issue. And that's exactly what Paul is avoiding here by, by not just throwing down his apostle card and just bossing him around. Okay? And then, um, so it's a relational and a spiritual concern. It's not a concern to be right. Paul is not all wrapped up about getting his way, about winning. He's concerned about Philemon's spiritual walk which is really a mature perspective, right? Imagine yourself in some kind of confrontation, conflict, that you are so concerned. I'm really concerned about your heart in this confrontation. That's a different perspective, isn't it? Usually we're like, no, you're wrong, and you, you hurt me, or you stepped out of bounds, so i got to set it right, justice. And Paul's like, I could, I could do that, but I want your faith to grow. I want it to become effective. I think that's fascinating. All right, that's what I've been saying. Philemon's faith grows through this specific opportunity to forgive Onesimus. Now, here's the deal. It is hard to keep the relationship 
bigger than the problem. When we have conflict, uh, certain, you know, like leaders and aggressive people, they kind of go to the problem, solve, 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 you know what I mean? And um, I can get that way task oriented and just bing, 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 and we're done. And then someone's crying and I'm like, what happened? Okay, so um, it's like a figure of speech, not really. Anyway, um, but seriously, how do we keep the relationship bigger than the problem? So do, do we, some of us gravitate towards, you know, relational aspects and some gravitate towards fixing problems. And so wherever we are, we just have to understand that um, we have room to move. So. And this is what he says here. He wraps it up. This is the bottom part of the affirmation sandwich. I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. So, again, he affirms him. This is my main concern. And then he affirms him. And that works really, really well. And so, a um, little story here. Uh, if I had a couple chairs up here, I would, I would do this for you. But when I was at Grace teaching there, we had chapel and have this, you know, these rows like that. And we had a guest speaker coming in, and um, he was at the front doing his thing. And I remember the front two rows, usually empty, but two girls sat where Jim is sitting, the second row back, and they kicked back, and they put up their feet on the, and they just, both feet, I can't do that because then I couldn't stand, but they put up both feet on the chair in front of them, and they just both sat there. So their feet were, were like seven feet from the guest speaker. And I'm just losing my mind with, with, with what in the world? And so, you know, I go through this, you know, anger and shame. I'm part of the university, and what kind of kids do you have? You know, I'm, I'm just making all this horrible stuff up in my head. And so, man, after chapel, I go to my office and, you know, this, this email that's just hot. And I didn't send it. Whew, that was God's grace. You ever do that? You're like, I'll just wait. And then I just deleted the whole thing because the Lord, the Lord gave me some grace and I was thinking of this. And so I wrote them a letter and I should have saved, I saved their response, but, but I, my letter was basically this saying, you know, um, I couldn't help but observe how you sat in chapel with your feet with our guest speaker. And I said, I know you would never intend to send this message, but body language is a thing. And so let me just share with you what unfortunately our guest speaker likely concluded. We don't want you here. We don't want to listen to you. We don't like you. You have nothing to say that's of interest. You know what I mean? I, I'd rather be somewhere else. I just list all these things. Now, I said, you girls are sweet girls. I, I honestly don't remember who they were. Um, but, but this is unfortunately the message that was sent through the body language. And, and, and I know you wouldn't intend to send that, but I, I really wanted to come alongside you and just share that because in the future, you could probably save yourself some grief if you just kind of are aware of this. So have a good day. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. And so here's the letter they, they sent back. It was amazing. They, um, they said, we have to tell you this email has blown us out of the water to display discipline in such a non-threatening and peaceful manner. It's not discipline, but whatever. Uh, we are in awe. We want you to know that we are completely in earnest. And when we tell you, you are the Yoda of disciplinary emails. Te <laughs> teach us your ways, O oh master. We were not threatened or resentful at all at the conclusion of your email, a response rarely experienced at the end of a disciplinary action of any kind. They keep going on this disciplinary thing, whatever. Um, expect our behavior to be modified according to the new mature viewpoint that you have taught us. Our minds will always turn to this email, even with a hint of a thought of putting our feet up. Thank you for taking the time to enlighten us. With utmost respect, students and questions. So, that was a win because I could have just boomed, lowered the, the, the authority, position, turned them in or whatever. But where is that going to get anybody? They're, they're going to build up walls of resentment. They're not going to change. And so I'm so grateful I didn't hit send when the letter was you know, right there, right? And so um, the lesson it is when we're in those modes and moments, maybe we need to step away from the situation for a few minutes, an hour, go for a walk, walk the dog get a dog, then walk the dog if you don't have a dog, and then, um, and then come back to it and just go, you know, the bigger issue here is, is your heart and my heart. I don't want my heart to be poisoned through this thing. So how can we move forward? See that? A whole different mature perspective instead of just start to you never, you always, shame and blame, all that doesn't work. So that's what's going on there. Um, so here's a simple reconstruction. Maybe you have somebody... Um, doing whatever. You can come along and say, hey, 
you know, I, I so respect your, your Christian life, how you're sincere about your walk with Jesus, and I um, appreciate this and that, but I've just noticed something, and I'm not perfect myself, but I, I, I just couldn't help but, but bring this up because I don't want you to suffer any ill consequences, but I, I think I'm observing this, could be or could not be true, pride, money, weird computer usage, whatever it is. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm not judging I have my own issues, but man, you know, if this is true, that, that leads someplace painful. And I really want to just bring it up because I love you and I love who you are in Christ. And I'm really sure that you're going to continue to grow in Christ. See the affirmation now on the bottom part? And, and I want you to continue to grow. And so I'm just confident you're going to hear this with the spirit in which I'm sharing it. That is a lot easier to take than, hey, you're wrong. Stop. See what I'm saying? So, um, and this goes into the parenting realm as well. You know, um, we parent for relationship. That doesn't mean we give them anything they want, but it means we do it in such a way as to make sure we maintain that relationship. You got to have that relationship when they leave the house. Because when they leave the house, they leave the house. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And so, um, you want to parent um, with relationship in mind. So, all that, having said all that, here we go to some observations about Paul and his relational maturity, spiritually relational maturity. As I said before, some people are problem-focused, and they just fix problems, and some people are uh, so relationally oriented, they never could mention a problem because it could threaten a relationship. So, we, you know, wherever you are in the continuum, we, we have to move different directions, okay? So... When the problem is all we see, we can sometimes run over people trying to fix the problem. You've probably seen this in various relationships or situations. Um, when we're relationship-centered, we value the person's heart. This is what Paul is doing with Philemon. He values his heart. He wants his faith to grow. He doesn't just want to win. He doesn't want to just get it right. He's aware that the other person is a moving object, a variable that he can't control, and he's doing everything he can to set up the stage to say, come with me as I follow Jesus. Here's an example. If, if, um, if I have, you know, Bob up here, Chuck or somebody, and I give him a rope, I can't push the rope to get him to do anything. Hey, hey, you should go do this. You can't push somebody with a rope. But if I pull him and say, follow me as I follow Jesus, or I'm not perfect, but I've experienced forgiveness, come with me, I can pull somebody as I'm leading them by my example, but I can't push somebody with a rope. And, and, and just like in life, I, I can't. Sometimes I speak at men's conferences, and, and um, the women will catch uh, this. They'll come up, and they'll go, how can I get my husband to do this? How can I make my husband? And I'm like, you can't. You, you, you can't make someone do, right? You, you just can't. I mean, anyway, there's some other things that you can do, but anyway. Um, so we can pull people along. If we lead and we're going first, but you can't really push. It just doesn't work. So, uh, remain relational. Spiritually mature people are able to remain relational. Why? Because they get their identity from Jesus. My identity is, is in what God says I am. I'm his child. So if you or someone, you know, someone honks at me or someone yells at me, my boss yells at me, or whatever happens, it's like, you know, maybe I need to, you know, show up on time or whatever it is. But, but I am okay in my inner being. I'm solid in who I am. So I don't have to start fighting and throwing spears at the person even though they're throwing spears at me. And I have deflected so many conversations that were hot and coming at me with all kinds of stuff, just being calm and go, wow, I can really see that. I would, I would feel the same way if I were you. And they're just kind of like, really? Yeah, I can understand your point of view. And you just let it sit there. And then once they kind of settle down, you go, well, let's try to fix this. How can I serve you? You know what I mean? It's, a whole, it's kind of fun, actually. But um, you have to be in that place, right, that stable place to, to make that work. Um, and there are days when I'm not there. <laughs> <coughs> All right. So, um, value relationships above problems. Check this out. Need some volume on that.
coming up from certain books, but I don't know if it's ever been stopped. <laughs> so, that is just so funny. Um, I saw that like five times before I realized the sweaters are snagging on the nail. I just didn't get it anyway. So I'm like, hey, Donna, the sweaters are snagging on the nail. And she's like, yeah, John. I'm like, anyway. So there is a situation where somebody is, is concerned about fixing problems, right? And that's that generally speaking how guys are wired, fixing things. And, you know, the, the lady just wants to be heard. And the guy's like, what? Anyway, so that's a classic relational thing. But basically, the difference can also be seen is, is that he was not connecting with her on the relational level. He was just trying to fix the problem. Now, I'm telling you, when you see the problem as clear as that, for you to not try to fix it will be very difficult. But sometimes the person just needs to be heard. And you can ask questions. Tell me how you feel about that. What are your thoughts about that? And in your head, like, I can solve this in three seconds. But trust me, go there. What do you feel about that? Tell me how, how, what, do you, what, do you thought, what are your thoughts about this, okay? And, um, and um, that, will, that will go better. Anyway, so that's a classic thing. So basically, relational maturity. Look at this little, this little chart of relational maturity. The infant, you know, they can't. I mean, the, the problem is bigger than the relationship involved. They just, they, they're, they're uh, limited with what they can do. Um, they just start to scream and shriek at the cost of relationship because they're not even aware of that, all right? Um, children, they really can't keep the relationship bigger than problems. It's kind of a, com a complicated construct for them to, to do. We teach them. We try to teach them that. One um, when, when just cop popped in my head here. Um, my wife and I were someplace in Texas at some baseball field kind of thing. And, you know, it was the, the home plate, the catcher area, and this big fence, you know, like 20 feet tall chain link fence. And um, one, two little siblings were there, and and one kid had crawled up about five feet on the, on the fence, crawled up. And his other brother came up and grabbed the bottom of the fence and just shaking it for all he's worth, trying to get his brother to fall. And the, the mom walks up and looks at the kid shaking the fence and says, you know, Joey, stop that. How would you like that if that was you? And he just never stopped. He just kept shaking like, whew. I'm like, mom, that thought level is too complicated for that kid. He's not going to be able to identify with what it would like, be like to be his brother anyway. So they, they just can't keep the relationship bigger than problems. Okay, so adults, we know how to keep the relationship bigger than problems. Sometimes we choose not to, but we know how, okay? You, will pro you, you rarely see an adult gravitate towards addictive behavior just to cope with stress, all right? We have other ways of doing stress, okay, dealing with stress. Then after adults, you've got parents, they model and teach the skills needed to thrive. And I know as parents, sometimes we don't feel, it's like, well, I got the baby, but I have no manual. How to be a dad? What do I do? Okay, that's a whole other sermon, but anyway. Um, and then elders, ready to take on the needs of the community, mentoring, discipling, suffering well. And so those are just some stages that we see in, in terms of remaining relational and moving forward with spiritual maturity. So after that, we're going to go to... Um, Returning to joy. I'm getting a lot of this stuff from a book called Rare Leadership, um, Remaining Relational and Returning to Joy. A spiritually mature person can return to joy, um, the book says, in 90 seconds. 
You have to train yourself to do that because it's not natural. If, if, I, if, if something happens and I spike emotionally, I hit the ceiling. We're in the movie last night. You know, the angry guy, sh- sh- both levers forward and, th- you know, the, from inside out. Anyway, uh, in minutes, not hours or not days, that takes skill and it's possible, okay? So um, do your emotions drive you or do you drive your emotions? Probably depends on the day, Right? Fair enough, probably depends on the day. Uh, but that's where we want to move. And so um, I was talking to Brian last night at the, the movie thing. And uh, the thing at work, he's got a thing going on at work. And he's starting to observe a pattern. He's like, you know, every Friday this happens. And it kind of spikes me, he said. And, and he starts to, he, he's counteracting that now. Because, okay, that, this, this is a pattern with the stress at work. And so he's starting to proactively deal with that to reduce that. So it doesn't wreck his weekend. I thought, that's a great example of someone returning to joy. You've got these things built into your schedule, and, and you, we just observe, like, spike, spike. I, you know, I, th- th- it triggers me every time. It's like, well, stop being triggered. Back up and look at it and, and change some things. And so that's a, that's a great example of someone who's, who's being, thinking broadly about their life and what's going on and, and how to uh, do different things to return to joy. Um, all right, so here's, here's the deal. God gave us emotions. You know, we don't want to be like the Stoics in ancient Greece where the, you, you, their whole goal was to crush them. They said, you know, emotions are a disease of the soul. Well, that, that's weird, okay? Uh, don't want to go there. But it is true that our desires worship God when our desires are his desires. And so our emotions and our desires are are, are a very important part of us, okay? Um, So we're supposed to find joy in what he finds joy in. We're supposed to be angered at what he is angered at. We're supposed to be disgusted at what he is disgusted at, okay? And we're supposed to fear the things that he says is threatening. But because of sin, it's all backwards. Now, we find joy in what he hates, all right? We're disgusted by what he says is good. We're fearful of what... He says, brings life. And so our sin has warped our desires, our emotions, and um, we need to move forward to that. We need, we need the redemption of Jesus because Jesus successfully navigated human life with emotions and didn't get sidetracked, okay? Um, so we need to find redemption in him. And again, as I move towards Jesus, so many complex problems don't disappear, but... They just come into focus, and I see a clear path forward through them. Okay, again, just because we're Christians doesn't mean I got no problems. It, it means that I'm seeing them clearly, I'm submitting to Jesus, and I'm looking for his work in my heart as I navigate troubled waters, and um, that's part of looking at joy too. Well, what about Paul? How does Paul return to joy? He's in jail. He's been, you look at the history of Paul at this point, he, he's in Roman prison. He's been in Caesarea prison. He's been three years of legal battles. Three years. And he sits here in jail and he has joy. That's crazy. He says, I thank my God as I remember you, Philemon. I have derived much joy from you. Um, so, so, in fact, he, the other prison epistle, the, the uh, Philippians, the theme of that whole book is joy right? In jail. So um, that's huge. We can choose to be joyful. Joy does not depend on our circumstances. We can choose to be joyful in the midst of disaster and pain because it's a matter of our focus. It's a matter of our attention, right? So can I ask you this? Why can't we choose joy even today? It's a matter of our focus, what can we be joyful about, all right? There are always things that we can be joyful about. Um, it doesn't mean there's no tears. It doesn't mean it won't be difficult, but we can still choose joy. All right. Um, so the other thing here, yeah, there's joy, sadness and joy from the, the, the deal. Choose joy. Um, the, the last thing, enduring hardship well. Paul was enduring hardship well. He's in prison. He's maintaining a joyful attitude. He's grateful for the work of the gospel going out. He says this in Philippians, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry. Now, that verse is always kind of 
prompted my weird imagination. I'm like, what kind of twisted soul is like, hey, he's in jail, so I'm going to go evangelize just to bother him. Like, well, it's just, what? I don't get that. Anyway, he says that happened, okay? But others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former, those that are trying to get to him, proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. <laughs> so this, this is Paul's bigger yes coming up right here. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed. That was Paul's focus. That's why he could choose joy. Because he chose a focus that transcended his comfort. He chose a joy based on kingdom issues. So to the, the degree that we choose joy connected to comfort, temporal issues, we're going to be a mess when our house floods. When we have a purpose of kingdom issues, does it mean there won't be tears, heartbreak, grief, suffering, and pain, but our world isn't shattered? and joy is possible. Death of a loved one, tragic family events, all those things force us to be, be, be beneath the, the throne. And, and, and the why and the what ifs, that's just part of the deal. But to end up going, Lord, you are enough. I, I have joy in who you are. That, that is enough. All right, that's, that's a tough thing. But that's, um, uh, Paul is enduring hardship well. You think Jesus endured hardship well. He's on the cross caring for other people. You know, John 19, Jesus saw his mother and John, the disciple he loved, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. And so, so even as he's dying, he's like, oh, someone should look after her. And, and he connects those two. So uh, Jesus suffered well because um, he had a kingdom focus and he was willing to suffer for that. So... Um, remaining relational, returning to joy, enduring hardship well, th those are marks of spiritual maturity that I see in Paul. And Paul is navigating some tricky waters here with Philemon. In fact, next week we'll get into this whole uh, patron-client relationship that just dominated the first century world. It's a really complex thing. Uh, it's like not that complex, but it's, it's just deeply embedded in the culture. So we'll see some of that. So, here are just a few strategies to help us move forward with um, remaining relational strategies. That, that doesn't mean like the leftover relational strategies. It, it means to stay in the relational strategies, okay? That word can be different ways. Curiosity. Something's happening, you're having a conflict. Instead of shaming, blaming, or yelling, what about this? You know, I'm, I'm curious, how long have you felt this way? Okay? Not, I'm curious, are you always this stupid? That's, that's not helpful, okay? So that kind of thing. And then we have, um, but curiosity, instead of attacking, that is a good place to start. Appreciation, appreciate this about you. Okay, that's that affirming thing. Affirm the concern. Kindness is always relational. Kindness is always relational, and so exercise kindness. Again, as we move towards Jesus, we see these things. Um, being possible. And then finally, we have the envelope of relationships. It spells cake. Anyway, the, the idea there is that I want to remain relational and surround the issue with the relationship in mind, not just win the issue and, and lose everything else that's important. So um, 70 times 7, it's not a math quiz. And you know what? We're out of time, so I don't have a quiz for you today. I'm so sorry. Seriously, though, um, I find joy in the challenge of um, affirming, sharing the main concern, and then affirming, remaining relational through all the bumps and bruises. Paul, Jesus did this, and um, there is hope for us as well. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the challenge of, of remaining relational, caring for people in the midst of very difficult circumstances. We, we need your grace and strength to do that well, and we pray that this week we would find some progress in that area. Amen.